Alms by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Amy Koenig My heart is what it was before, a house where people come and go, but it is winter with your love. The sashes are beset with snow. I light the lamp and lay the cloth, I blow the coals to blaze again, but it is winter with your love. The frost is thick upon the pane. I know a winter when it comes. The leaves are listless on the boughs. I watched your love a little while and brought my plants into the house. I water them and turn them south and snap the dead brown from the stem, but it is winter with your love. I only tend and water them. There was a time I stood and watched the small ill-natured sparrows fray. I loved the beggar that I fed. I cared for what he had to say. I stood and watched him out of sight. Today I reach around the door and set the bowl upon the step. My heart is what it was before, but it is winter with your love. I scatter crumbs upon the sill and close the window, and the birds may take or leave them as they will. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Baggage Coach Ahead by Gussie L. Davis Read for LibriVox.org by Delmar H. Dolbeer On a dark, stormy night, as the train rattled on, all the passengers had gone to bed, except one young man with a babe in his arms, who sat there with a bowed-down head. The innocent one began crying just then, as though its poor heart would break. One angry man said, Make that child stop its noise, for it's keeping all of us awake. Put it out, said another. Don't keep it in here. We've paid for our berths and want rest. But never a word said the man with the child as he fondled it close to his breast. Where is its mother? Go take it to her, this a lady then softly said. I wish I could, was the man's sad reply. But she's dead in the coach ahead. While the train rolled onward, a husband sat in tears, thinking of the happiness of just a few short years. Baby's face brings pictures of a cherished hope that's dead. But baby's cries can't waken her in the baggage coach ahead. Every eye filled with tears when his story he told of a wife who was faithful and true. He told how he'd saved up his earnings for years just to build up a home for two. How when heaven had sent them this sweet little babe, their young happy lives were blessed. His heart seemed to break when he mentioned her name, and in tears tried to tell them the rest. Every woman rose to assist with the child. There were mothers and wives on that train. And soon was the little one sleeping in peace with no thought of sorrow or pain. Next morn at a station he bade all good-bye. God bless you, he softly said. Each one had a story to tell in their homes of the baggage coach ahead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Deary Ode by James McIntyre Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia Deary Ode Our muse it doth refuse to sing Of cheese made early in the spring When cows give milk from spring fodder You cannot make a good cheddar The quality is often vile Of cheese that is made in April Therefore we think for that reason you should make later in the season. Cheese-making you should delay until about the first of May. Then cows do feed on grassy field, and rich milk they abundant yield. Ontario cannot compete with the northwest in raising wheat. For cheaper there they it can grow, so price in future may be low. 
Though this a hardship, it may seem, rejoice that you have got the cream, in this land of milk and honey, where dairy farmers do make money. Utensils must be clean and sweet, so cheese with first class can compete, and daily polish up milk pans, take pains with vats and with milk cans. And it is important matter to allow no stagnant water, but water from pure well or stream the cow must drink to give pure cream. Canadian breeds tis best to pair with breeds from the shire of air. They thrive on our Canadian feed, and are for milking splendid breed. Though gainst spring cheese some do mutter, yet spring milk also makes bad butter. Then there doth arise the query how to utilize it in the dairy. The milk it floats in great spring flood, though it is not so rich and good, let us be thankful for this stream of milk, and also curds and cream. All dairymen their highest aims should be to make the Vale of Thames, where milk doth so abundant flow, Dairyland of Ontario. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Deed by Emily Dickinson Read for LibriVox.org by Frieda Schneider A deed knocks first at thought, and then it knocks at will. That is the manufacturing spot, and will at home and well. It then goes out an act, or is entombed so still, that only to the ear of God its doom is audible. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Domination of Black by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp At night by the fire the colors of the bushes and of the fallen leaves repeating themselves turned in the room like the leaves themselves turning in the wind. Yes, but the color of the heavy hemlocks came striding, and I remembered the cry of the peacocks. The colors of their tails were like the leaves themselves turning in the wind, in the twilight wind. They swept over the room, just as they flew from the boughs of the hemlocks down to the ground. I heard them cry, the peacocks. Was it a cry against the twilight, or against the leaves themselves turning in the wind, turning as the flames turned in the fire, turning as the tails of the peacocks turned in the loud fire, loud as the hemlocks full of the cry of the peacocks? Or was it a cry against the hemlocks? Out of the window I saw how the planets gathered like the leaves themselves turning in the wind. I saw how the night came, came striding like the color of the heavy hemlocks. I felt afraid, and I remembered the cry of the peacocks. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Embers by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Simmons I said, my youth is gone, like a fire beaten out by the rain that will never sway and sing or play with the wind again. I said, it is no great sorrow that quenched my youth in me, but only little sorrows beating ceaselessly. I thought my youth was gone, but you returned like a flame at the call of the wind. It leaped and burned, threw off its ashen cloak, and gowned anew, gave itself like a bride once more to you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. General William Booth Enters into Heaven by Vashel Lindsay Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. To be sung to the tune of The Blood of the Lamb with Indicated Instruments. Booth led boldly with his big bass drum, Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? The saints smiled gravely, and they said, He's come! 
are you washed in the blood of the lamb walking lepers followed rank on rank lurching bravos from the ditches dank drabs from the alleyways and drug fiends pale minds still passion ridden soul powers frail vermin eaten saints with mouldy breath unwashed legions with the ways of death are you washed in the blood of the lamb every slum had sent its half a score the round world over booth had grown for more every banner that the wide world flies bloomed with glory and transcendent dyes big voice lasses made their banjos bang tranced fanatical they shrieked and sang are you washed in the blood of the lamb hallelujah it was queer to see bull-necked convicts with that land make free loons with trumpets blowed a blare 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 on on upward through the golden air are you washed in the blood of the lamb booth died blind and still by faith he trod i still dazzled by the ways of god booth led boldly and he looked the chief eagle countenance in sharp relief beard a-flying heir of high command unabated in that holy land jesus came from out the courthouse door stretched his hands above the passing poor booth saw not but led his queer ones there round and round the mighty courthouse square yet in an instant all that blear review marched on spotless clad in raiment new the lame were straightened withered limbs uncurled and blind eyes opened on a new sweet world drabs and vixens in a flash made whole gone was the weasel head the snout the jowl sages and sibyls now and athletes clean rulers of empires and of forests green the hosts were sandaled and their wings were fire are you washed in the blood of the lamb but their noise played havoc with the angel choir are you washed in the blood of the lamb oh shout salvation it was good to see kings and princes by the lamb set free the banjos rattled and the tambourines jing jing jingled in the hands of queens and when booth halted by the curb for prayer he saw his master through the flag-filled air christ came gently with a robe and crown for booth the soldier while the throng knelt down he saw king jesus they were face to face and he knelt a weeping in that holy place are you washed in the blood of the lamb End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. History by Edgar Fawcett Read for LibriVox.org by Rest in Shade He that the record of mankind would trace With all its virtues, faults, hopes, passions, fears in hardier scripture than a few fleet years to dull oblivion may at last efface must plunge his look far deeper than of old among time's ruinous heaps of dross and gold for every potentate whatever his pride bows to still mightier forces dim remote his very tyrannies like his mercies float as wandering foam on the vast human tide that sleeps or swings in that mysterious flood wrought red and bounteous from a nation's blood ye therefore whom profounder truth contents than babble of light court lady prince or page tell how through altering peoples age by age great causes fructified in great events nor heed mere kings with splendors frail and brief frederick the great bonaparte the thief end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Jenny Kissed Me by Lee Hunt Read for LibriVox.org by Patrick Wallace Jenny kissed me when we met, jumping from the chair she sat in. Time, you thief, who love to get sweets into your list, put that in. Say I'm weary, say I'm sad, say that health and wealth have missed me. Say I'm growing old, but add, Jenny kissed me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. King Robert of Sicily by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Delmar H. Dolbeer Robert of Sicily, brother of Pope Urbane and Valmond, Emperor of Alamein, Apparelled in magnificent attire, with retinue of many a knight and squire, on St. John's Eve at Vespers, proudly sat and heard the priest chant the Magnificat. And as he listened, o'er and o'er again repeated, like a burden or refrain, he caught the words, Deposuit potentes de sede et exultavit humiles. And slowly lifting up his kingly head, he to the learned clerk beside him said, What mean these words? The clerk made answer meet. He has put down the mighty from their seat, and has exalted them of low degree. Thereat King Robert muttered scornfully, Tis well that such seditious words are sung only by priests and in the Latin tongue, for unto priests and people be it known. There is no power can push me from my throne. And leaning back, he yawned and fell asleep, lulled by the chant, monotonous and deep. When he awoke, it was already night. Church was empty, and there was no light, save where the lamps that glimmered few and faint lighted a little space before some saint. He started from his seat and gazed around, but saw no living thing and heard no sound. He groped toward the door, but it was locked. He cried aloud, and listened, and then knocked, and uttered awful threatenings, and complaints, and imprecations upon men and saints. The sounds re-echoed from the roof and walls, as if dead priests were laughing in their stalls. At length the sexton, hearing from without the tumult of the knocking and the shout, and thinking thieves were in the house of prayer, came with his lantern, asking, "'Who is there?' Half choked with rage, King Robert fiercely said, Open, tis I, the king! Art thou afraid? The frightened sexton, muttering with a curse, This is some drunken vagabond, or worse, turned the great key and flung the portal wide. A man rushed by him at a single stride, haggard, half-naked, without hat or cloak, who neither turned nor looked at him nor spoke but leaped into the blackness of the night and vanished like a spectre from his sight. Robert of Sicily, brother of Pope Urbane and Valmond, Emperor of Alamein, despoiled of his magnificent attire, bareheaded, breathless, and besprent with mire, with sense of wrong and outrage desperate, strode on and thundered at the palace gate, rushed through the courtyard, thrusting in his rage to right and left each seneschal and page, and hurried up the broad and thounding stair, his white face ghastly in the torch's glare. From hall to hall he rushed in breathless speed, voices and cries he heard but did not heed, until at last he reached the banquet room, blazing with light and breathing with perfume. There on the dais sat another king, wearing his robes, his crown, his signet ring. King Robert's self, in feature, form, and height, but all transfigured with angelic light. It was an angel, and his presence there with a divine effulgence filled the air, an exaltation piercing the disguise, though none the hidden angel recognize. A moment speechless, motionless, amazed, the throneless monarch on the angel gazed, who met his look of anger and surprise with the divine compassion of his eyes, then said, Who art thou, and why comest thou here? To which King Robert answered with a sneer, 
I am the king and come to claim my own from an impostor who usurps my throne. And suddenly, at these audacious words, up sprang the angry guest and drew their swords. The angel answered with unruffled brow, Nay, not the king, but the king's jester. Thou henceforth shall wear the bells and scalloped cape, and for thy counsellor shall lead an ape. Thou shalt obey my servants when they call, and wait upon my henchmen in the hall. Deaf to King Robert's threats and cries and prayers, they thrust him from the hall and down the stairs. A group of tittering pages ran before, and as they opened wide the folding doors, his heart failed, for he heard with strange alarms the boisterous laughter of the men-at-arms, and all the vaulted chamber roar and ring with the mock plaudits of Long Live the King! Next morning, waking with the day's first beam, he said within himself, It was a dream. But the straw rustled as he turned his head. There were the cap and bells beside his bed. Around him rose the bare, discolored walls. Close by the steeds were champing in their stalls, and in the corner a revolting shape, shivering and chattering, sat the wretched ape. It was no dream. The world he loved so much had turned to dust and ashes at his touch. Days came and went, and now returned again to Sicily the old Saturnian reign. Under the angel's governess benign, the happy island danced with corn and wine, and deep within the mountain's burning breast, Enceladus the giant was at rest. Meanwhile, King Robert yielded to his fate sullen and silent and disconsolate, dressed in the motley garb that jesters wear, with look bewildered and a vacant stare, close-shaven above the ears as monks are shorn, by courtiers mocked, by pages laughed to scorn. His only friend the ape, his only food what others left. He still was unsubdued. And when the angel met him on his way, and half in earnest, half in jest, would say sternly, though tenderly, that he might feel the velvet scabbard held a sword of steel, Art thou the king? The passion of his woe burst from him in resistless overflow, and lifting high his forehead, he would fling the haughty answer back, I am, I am the king! Almost three years were ended when there came ambassadors of great repute and fame from Balmond, emperor of Alamein, unto King Robert, saying that Pope Urbane by letter summoned them forthwith to come on Holy Thursday to his city of Rome. The Pope received them with great pomp and blare of bannered trumpets on St. Peter's Square, giving his benediction and embrace, fervent and full of apostolic grace, while with congratulations and with prayers he entertained the angel unawares. Robert, the jester, bursting through the crowd into their presence, rushed and cried aloud, I am the king! Look and behold in me, Robert, your brother, king of Sicily! This man who wears my semblance in your eyes is an impostor in a king's disguise. Do you not know me? Does no voice within answer my cry, and say we are akin? The Pope, in silence, but with troubled mien, gazed at the angel's countenance serene. The Emperor, laughing, said, It is strange sport to keep a madman for thy fool at court. And the poor baffled jester in disgrace was hustled back among the populace. In solemn state the Holy Week went by, and Easter Sunday gleamed upon the sky. The presence of the angel, with its light before the sun rose, made the city bright, and with new fervor filled the hearts of men who felt that Christ indeed had risen again. Even the jester, on his bed of straw, with haggard eyes, the unwanted splendor saw. He felt within a power unfelt before, and kneeling humbly on the chamber floor, he heard the rushing garments of the Lord sweep through the silent air ascending heavenward. 
and now the visit ending and once more Valmond returning to the Danube's shore, homeward the angel journeyed, and again the land was made resplendent with his train, flashing along the towns of Italy unto Salerno, and from thence by sea. And when once more within Palermo's wall, and seated on the throne in his great hall, he heard the Angelus from convent towers, as if a better world conversed with ours. He beckoned to King Robert to draw nigher, and with a gesture bade the rest retire. And when they were alone, the angel said, Art thou the king? Then, bowing down his head, King Robert crossed both hands upon his breast, and meekly answered him, Thou knowest best. My sins as scarlet are. Let me go hence, and in some cloister's school of penitence, across those stones that pave the way to heaven, walk barefoot, till my guilty soul be shriven. The angel smiled, and from his radiant face a holy light illuminated all the place and through the open window loud and clear they heard the monks chant in the chapel near above the noise and tumult of the street he has put down the mighty from their seat and has exalted them of low degree and through the chant a second melody rose like the throbbing of a single string i am an angel and thou art the king King Robert, who was standing near the throne, lifted his eyes, and, lo, he was alone. But all apparelled, as in days of old, with ermined mantle and with cloth of gold, and when his courtiers came, they found him there, kneeling upon the floor, absorbed in silent prayer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Languages by Carl Sandberg Read for LibriVox.org by Carolina Caliaba Languages There are no handles upon a language whereby men take hold of it and mark it with signs for its remembrance. It is a river, this language, one in a thousand years, breaking a new course, changing its way to the ocean. It is mountain effluvia moving to valleys, and from nation to nation, crossing borders and mixing. Languages die like rivers. Words wrap round your tongue today and broke into shape of thought, between your teeth and lips speaking, now and today shall be faded hieroglyphs ten thousand years from now. Sing, and singing remember. Your song dies and changes, and it is not here tomorrow, any more than the wind blowing ten thousand years ago. End of the poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Last Duchess by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Matt Whitfeld That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands work busily a day, and there she stands. Will please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, that depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I've drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess' cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, Her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was curtsy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart... How shall I say? Too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, twas all one. My favour at her breast. 
the dropping of the daylight in the west the bow of cherry summer fishes full broke in the orchard for her the white mule she rode with round the terrace all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least she thanked men good but thanked somehow uh, i know not how as if she ranked my gift of nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling even had you skill in speech which i have not to make your will quite clear to such an one and say just this or that in you disgusts me here you miss or there exceed the mark and if she let herself be lessened so nor plainly said her words to yours forsooth and made excuse even that would be some stooping and i choose never to stoop oh sir she smiled no doubt whenever i passed her but who passed without much the same smile this grew i gave commands then all smiles stuck together there she stands as if alive will please your eyes we'll meet the company below then i repeat the count your masters no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretence of mine for dowry will be disallowed though his fair daughter's self as i avowed at starting is my object nay we'll go together down sir a notice neptune though taming a sea-horse thought a rarity which claus of innsbruck cast in bronze for me End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mystery by Sarah Teasdale. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Your eyes drink of me. Love makes them shine, your eyes that lean so close to mine. We have long been lovers. We know the range of each other's moods, and how they change. But when we look at each other so, then we feel how little we know. The spirit eludes us, timid and free. Can I ever know you, or you know me? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode on the Mammoth Cheese by James McIntyre Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia Ode on the Mammoth Cheese Weight over 7,000 pounds We have seen thee, Queen of Cheese, Lying quietly at your ease, Gently fanned by evening breeze, Thy fair form no flies dare seize. Or gaily dressed soon you'll go to the great provincial show to be admired by many a beau in the city of toronto cows numerous as a swarm of bees or as the leaves upon the trees it did require to make thee please and stand unrivalled queen of cheese may you not receive a scar as we have heard that mr harris intends to send you off as far as the great world show at paris of the youth beware of these for some of them might rudely squeeze and bite your cheek then songs or glees we could not sing o queen of cheese wert thou suspended from balloon you'd cast a shade even at noon folks would think it was the moon about to fall and crush them soon end of poem this recording is in the public domain Passer Mortuus Est by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Amy Koenig Death devours all lovely things. Lesbia with her sparrow shares the darkness. Presently every bed is narrow. Unremembered as old rain dries the sheer libation. And the little petulant hand is an annotation. After all, my erstwhile dear, my no longer cherished, Need we say it was not love just because it perished? End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Bob Gonzalez, July 4, 2011 Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, If the British march by land or sea from the town to-night, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the north church tower as a signal light, one if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said good night, and with muffled oar silently rowed to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay where swinging wide at her moorings lay the somerset british man-o-war a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar and a huge black hulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide meanwhile his friend through alley and street wanders and watches with eager ears till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barrack door the sound of arms and the tramp of feet and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed the tower of the old north church by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch on the sombre rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade. By the trembling ladder steep and tall to the highest window in the wall, where he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath in the churchyard lay the dead, in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still that he could hear like a sentinel's tread the watchful night wind as it went creeping along from tent to tent and seeming to whisper, All is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour, the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead, for suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away, where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now gazed on the landscape far and near, then impetuous stamped the earth and turned and tightened his saddle girth, but mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old north church as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and sombre and still, and lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes, till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns, a hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles in passing a spark struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet. That was all, and yet through the gloom and the light the fate of a nation was riding that night and the spark struck out by that steed in his flight kindled the land into flame with its heat he has left the village and mounted the steep and beneath him tranquil and broad and deep is the mystic meeting the ocean tides and under the alders that skirt its edge now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. He heard the crowing of the cock and the barking of the farmer's dog, and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed and the meeting-house windows blank and bare gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. 
It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord town. He heard the bleating of the flock and the twitter of birds among the trees, and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadows brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest. In the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear. A voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo for evermore. For born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoof-beat of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Soiled Hands by Mercedes de Acosta, read for LibriVox.org by August Wilson. After everyone had left, it was always so wonderful, sitting in the dark theater with you. There was a mystery about it, as though the echo of many plays still lingered in the folds of the curtain, while phantom figures crouched low in the chairs, beating applause with vapor hands. Do you remember how we always sat silently? I would shut my eyes to feel your closeness nearer. Then slowly, and like a ritual, I would take your hand, and you would laugh a little and say, My hands are awfully sticky, or I can't seem to keep my hands clean in this theater. As if that mattered. As if that mattered. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by Alice Dunbar Nelson. Read for LibriVox.org by Isha Mitchell in Denver, Colorado. I had no thought of violets of late, the wild shy kind that spring beneath your feet in wistful April days, when lovers mate and wander through the fields in rapture sweet. The thought of violets meant florist shops, and bows and pens and perfume papers fine, and garish lights and mincing little fops and cabarets and songs and deadening wine. So far from sweet real things my thoughts had strayed. I had forgot wide fields and clear brown streams, the perfect loveliness that God has made, wild violets shy in heaven-mounting dreams. And now, unwittingly, you've made me dream of violets and my soul's forgotten gleam. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Summer by Alexander Pope. Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman. See what delights in sylvan scenes appear. Descending gods have found Elysium here. In woods bright Venus with Adonis strayed, And chaste Diana haunts the forest shade. Come, lovely nymph, and bless the silent hours, When swains from shearing seek their nightly bowers, When weary reapers quit the sultry field, And crowned with corn, their thanks to Cirrus yield. This harmless grove no lurking viper hides, But in my breast the serpent love abides. Here bees from blossoms sip the rosy dew, But your Alexis knows no sweets but you. O oh, deign to visit our forsaken seats, The mossy fountains and the green retreats. Where'er you walk, cool gales shall fan the glade, Trees where you sit shall crowd into a shade. Where'er you tread, the blushing flowers shall rise, And all things flourish where you turn your eyes. Oh, how I long with you to pass my days, Invoke the muses and resound your praise. Your praise the birds shall chant in every grove, And winds shall waft it to the powers above. But would you sing and rival Orpheus's strain, the wandering forest soon should dance again. The moving mountains hear the powerful call, And headlong streams hang listening in their fall. But see, the shepherds shun the noonday heat, The lowing herds to murmuring brooks retreat. To closer shades the panting flocks remove, Ye gods, and is there no relief for love? But soon the sun with milder rays descends To the cool ocean where his journey ends. On me love's fiercer flames for every prey. By night he scorches as he burns by day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Summer Magic by Leslie Pinckney Hill, read for LibriVox.org by Isha Mitchell in Denver, Colorado. So many cares to vex the day, so many fears to haunt the night, my heart was all but weaned away from every lure of old delight. Then summer came, announced by June, with beauty, miracle, and mirth. She hung aloft the rounding moon, she poured her sunshine on the earth. She drove the sap and broke the bud, she set the crimson rose afire. She stirred again my sullen blood, and waked in me a new desire. Before my cottage door she spread the softest carpet nature weaves, and deftly arched above my head a canopy of shady leaves. Her nights were dreams of jeweled skies, her days were bowers rife with song. And many a scheme did she devise to heal the hurt and soothe the wrong. For on the hill or in the dell, or where the brook went leaping by, or where the fields would surge and swell with golden wheat or bearded rye, I felt her heart against my own, I breathed the sweetness of her breath, till all the cark of time had flown, and I was lord of life and death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. There Will Come Soft Rains by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Ann Simmons There will come soft rains And the smell of the ground And swallows circling with their shimmering sound And frogs in the pool singing at night and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Thirteen Ways of Looking at a Blackbird by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet 1. Among twenty snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. 2. I was of three minds, like a tree in which there are three blackbirds. 3. The blackbird whirled in the autumn wind. It was a small part of the pantomime. 4. A man and a woman are one. A man and a woman and a blackbird are one. 5. I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling or just after. 6. Icicles filled the window with barbaric glass. The shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro. The mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause. 7. O oh, thin men of Haddam, why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the women about you? 8. I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms, but I know too that the blackbird is involved in what I know. 9. When the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. 10. At the sight of blackbirds flying in a green light, even the bawds of euphony would cry out sharply. 11. He rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once a fear pierced him, in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. 12. The river is moving. The blackbird must be flying. 13. It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limbs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Amarantha, that she would dishevel her hair, by Richard Lovelace, read for LibriVox.org, by August Wilson. Amarantha, sweet and fair, Ah, braid no more that shining hair. As my curious hand or eye, Hovering round thee, let it fly. Let it fly as unconfined As its calm ravisher the wind, Who hath left his darling the east, To wanton over that spicy nest. Every tress must be confessed, But neatly tangled at the best. Like a clue of golden thread, most excellently ravel it. Do not then wind up that light in ribbons and o'er cloud and night, like the sun in its early ray, but shake your head and scatter day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.